Good afternoon and welcome to today's, this afternoon's energy seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure. I'm really excited to introduce our speaker to, 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 to today, Michelle Sim, who's Director of Sustainability for SoCal Gas. Uh, Michelle joined the Sempra uh, Utilities Group in 2013 and has served in various uh, energy and strategic growth uh, initiative roles, including environmental uh, policy development roles in clean energy, uh, transportation, residential and commercial sectors, as well as initiatives on hydrogen and CCS. Uh, today, she's gonna to talk to us about SoCal Gas's commitment to net zero emissions by 2045, uh, which is an extraordinary uh, target to set for uh, what is now the biggest gas distribution company in the United States. So Michelle's gonna tell us uh, what magic she's gonna use uh, to get there. And I'm really uh, excited on behalf of all of us uh, to hear uh, what she has to say. So Michelle, take it away. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, my name is Michelle Sim, as John noted, Director of Sustainability at SoCal Gas. And I'm so excited to be here this afternoon. Um, a lot of my excitement really has to do with how I came to be in front of you all today. Um, earlier this year, a colleague of mine had asked if I would have a conversation with somebody about sustainability. And I had agreed. And so they went ahead and sent me their bio and their background. And one thing um, that I noticed that as soon as I, I looked at this person's bio and um, background is that I was almost certain that we would have very little in common. I mean, we came from very different backgrounds. He was a Stanford grad through and through. I graduated from Cal and yes, I'm a bear, but I hear from John that we are um, definitely surrounded by a few bears in this audience today. Um, he was also an accomplished athlete. Um, he was the MVP at the Rose Bowl, pretty impressive. I was always the last one chosen on any sports team, let alone catch a football from 40 yards out. He's a bona fide scientist and engineer that studied nanoparticles and chemical kinetics and I am not. Um, so with just these few differences, um, I started to prepare myself mentally. I also prepped a lot of stats and diagrams and talking points of why the gas system shouldn't be dismissed or disregarded or taken for granted. And I assumed that his environmental position would be electrification and that our differences would dominate the conversation. Well, after about a third of the way through our conversation, I had an aha moment. I realized in that moment that I had made a huge mistake because I narrowly focused on all the differences that we had had. I failed to recognize the opportunity to connect with this person. I only focused on what I thought was readily apparent and I say again, I failed to recognize the opportunity. As my kids would put it, that was quote unquote an epic fail on my part because I thought that our biggest differences would have the most impact on our conversation. And boy, was I wrong because after our conversation, what I realized that we actually had more common goals, even though we came from very big different backgrounds in our journeys, um, were significantly different, we recognized that our goals were bigger than ourselves and that our goals were common in helping humanity and our planet. One might even call my epic fail as an unconscious bias. And this is the same premise I held onto as we developed our sustainability plan and climate commitment. I wanted to focus on the opportunities that were ahead of us and start having conversations on common goals, goals that were bigger than ourselves. So in this conversation, it is my hope that you will set aside any conscious and or unconscious bias you may have for the next 45 minutes. Leave it at the door. Leave any preconceived notions that you may have about sustainability, natural gas, electricity, energy, climate change, and even being an environmentalist and be open to a broader understanding of sustainability from a vantage point that you may not have thought of before. 
don't make the same mistake I made. Um, and in the same way in which that one conversation led me to be in front of all of you today, I hope that this conversation helps to navigate you through your journey. Um, and as you, and who knows, you may even find yourself speaking in front of an audience full of Cal students one day. So for those of you who may not be familiar with SoCal Gas, we are a regulated gas utility headquarters in Los Angeles, California. Up here in the Bay Area, you may recognize the name PG&E, um, the regulated investor owned electric and gas utility that serves you. Along with PG&E, SoCal Gas is one of five investor owned utility companies in California with oversight from the California Public Utilities Commission. Although SoCal Gas is regionally located and serving customers in Southern California, we are the largest gas distribution utility in the United States with over 100,000 miles of pipeline infrastructure. We deliver affordable, reliable, and increasingly renewable gas service to nearly 22 million customers in over 500 communities and across 20,000 square miles of Central and Southern California. And over the past 150 years, uh, we have a long history, we have been evolving currently on the cutting edge of innovation with methane reduction, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. We were the first in the nation to aerially map our methane emissions, allowing us to track and mitigate methane emissions faster. This has helped us to be one of the best performing gas systems in the country. We also have the largest gas energy efficiency program in the nation with the largest portfolio of energy, energy efficiency achievements. We were the first in the nation to install smart meters for the gas system. It provides data and allows us uh, to inspect and help customers manage their energy use. We also were first movers on renewable natural gas. I'll go more into that a little bit later. And we also partnered with academia like UC Irvine to be the first in the nation to demonstrate and test green hydrogen pipeline injection. This is where we use surplus renewable power to produce clean hydrogen and blend it into the gas system. This provides long-term storage that enables more renewable power on the electric grid while providing deeper decarbonization of energy across the ecosystem. So we've had a lot of firsts throughout our history. And earlier this year, on March 23rd, we added another first by developing and shaping our first published sustainability plan, Aspire 2045, which is our sustainability and climate commitment to net zero. But let me be clear, sustainability and how it lives in our organization is not new. It is a craft that we have been shaping and evolving for over 150 years. And today, what I wanna focus in this conversation are three things. One, the opportunities we have to reach our carbon neutrality target while preserving choice and energy resiliency. Second, the opportunities we have to lead in a significant way. And finally, the opportunity we have in making progress towards our climate goals. Now, our sustainability strategy and plan stands on four pillars. These four pillars, in it, it really is what's truly most important to us as a company. Priority number one is always safety. Safety is a culture and a mindset that highlights our values of leadership, risk management, preparedness, and continuous improvement. We also highlight the importance of operating a resilient system. Resiliency of our system, not to be confused with reliability, is critical. There's a really important distinction here, um, and I wanna raise it because it's important. Reliability is a system working well, really well under normal operating conditions. Resiliency, however, is how the system operates under not normal conditions or what I like to call stress conditions and circumstances. We see this during natural disaster, wildfires, the polar vortex, hurricanes, um, and potential brownouts and blackouts. 
So it's really important to understand that reliability and resiliency is different, and we are about driving resilient operations to enable reliability. And our company would not be what it is today without the people and the diversity of thought. We will continue to be a catalyst to highlight and mobilize social diversity, equity, inclusion within our company and communities. And as we transform our business and enable the energy transition, we are not only supporting, but we are positioning ourselves to lead California's transition to the clean energy future. And as we build out a broader sustainability plan with these four pillars, our first step was making a bold climate commitment. Our climate commitment is to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions in our operations and delivery of energy by 2045. And in doing so, SoCal Gas became the largest gas distribution utility in the nation to include all three scope emissions in our target. This aligns with the Paris Climate Agreement's recommendations to limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius by mid-century. And it supports California's 2045 carbon neutrality goals and demonstrates the gas system's essential role in advancing a carbon neutral economy. Now, I want to take the time to explain a little bit about why the inclusion of scopes one, two, and three is so important. For some that may not be as familiar with the three scopes of emissions, scope one and two emissions are what SoCal Gas produces from its operations, fleet, energy use in buildings, and fugitive emissions. These are emissions that we control and we contribute. And for SoCal Gas, scopes one and two emissions make up only 4% of our emissions, only four. The bulk of the emissions, about 96%, is made up of what we call scope three emissions. Now, scope three is a good reminder that SoCal Gas is more than an energy company. It is an infrastructure company. That means that all the energy that passes through our pipelines to our customers have an associated carbon intensity. And as the energy transporter, we inherit those emissions. Said differently, these emissions result from our customers' consumption of energy. And today, scope three emissions are currently being addressed by our energy efficiency programs. There's a reason why we have the largest energy efficiency program in the nation. Um, it is to curb our scope three emissions. But energy efficiency alone cannot get us to our goals, which is why we are undertaking initiatives to support our customers to transition to lower and zero carbon fuels so that as it passes through our pipelines, we are able to decrease the carbon intensity of the energy that we transport. Now, there's a couple of things we know and we don't know. What we know <laughs> is that we have a pretty good idea of how we can manage our scope one and two emissions. These are things that we can control. What we also know is that scope three emissions, the emissions not produced or controlled by SoCal Gas will be a challenge. So there is no magic sauce like John alluded to. Um, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of cooperation and collaboration. Now, Here's where the opportunity is. The opportunity here is to have a platform on which we can have some healthy discussions around the importance of decarbonizing our energy ecosystem. And that includes the gas system with clean molecules and clean fuels. If the state is going to reach its carbon neutrality goals, it's gonna need all the help that it can get and it's going to need both the electric and the gas system. Sustainability is a platform for us to really start having conversations about the intersectionality of climate, waste, and water, but more importantly, how we deliver, produce, and manage energy is going to have an, an implicit and explicit impact on the communities that we serve and the people that use that energy on the basis of affordability, accessibility, 
And all of this needs to be done transparently, not only for communication, but so that people know how much progress we're making. And this is where we need to have everyone around the table with actionable frameworks of purpose and intent towards a decarbonized energy future. Our net zero commitment goes beyond the walls of our company. It is about doing our part to have impact and influence in our communities, locally, nationally, and globally. How we innovate matters because the solutions we create will have to be one that can get to scale locally to bring down costs, but also be easily transportable to third world countries that do not have access to modern energy systems. This commitment means leveraging all that is available to us and supporting an integrated energy system that will provide clean, reliable, and affordable energy to customers, you and I included, for many years to come. And these ideas will have far reaching impacts across the globe. Now, as we continue to operate safely, reliably, and more efficiently, our commitment is focused around what we call the three Ds, decarbonization, diversification, and digitalization. Now with decarbonization, we need to think about decarbonization not as electrification. A lot of people think that they are one and the same, but we really need to think about it as the integration of the electric and gas grid. And going back to my distinction that I made between reliability and resiliency, the gas grid is inherently resilient because most of it is underground and protected to a large degree. And as we lean more into electrification, we need to consider how we have a constant and consistent source of electricity. And this is where the gas grid has tremendous complementary values to get us to 100% renewable portfolio standard without sacrificing reliability and withstand the growing natural disasters without sacrificing resiliency. And on top of that, it's to support the reduction of carbon intensity across all economic sectors that are foundational, foundational to the prosperity of our economy, but also towards achieving carbon neutrality. Diversification. How we think of diversification is more of a risk management tool. Um, it is what I like to call it. It's never wise to put all your eggs in one basket. And as we look at impacts of natural disasters and wildfires in California, having multiple sources of energy is critical. So it doesn't cripple our economy. The reality is that not all sectors, like the industrial processing, manufacturing and transportation sectors, they cannot fully electrify. It is physically impossible. This also leads to significant negative impacts to our most disadvantaged customers. If these large GHG emitting industries cannot reduce its emissions, the most impacted are the disadvantaged communities. So diversification of energy sources have a direct impact on our social responsibilities as community members. In securing the ability to purchase and supply and transport responsibly sourced gas, lower and zero carbon gases, such as renewable natural gas, hydrogen, and other low carbon sources that become available in the future will be critical. Now, digitalization. We are in a fast paced, rapidly changing industry um, and the utilities are going through its own digital transformation. And digitalization is going to be a key component in unlocking our potential and accelerating our progress. As a utility, what we're doing today is we're looking at things like spatial relational tools and machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence to reduce risks for things like cross-bore inspections, pipeline inspections. Who would have thought? Um, the internet of things help us to continue to update our digital platforms. It increases upticks of things like paperless billing. 
Um, it allows us to use advanced meter data for predictive and prescriptive analytics, and it supports effective planning and scheduling of our customer service field employees. All this to say that this type of asset tracking system integrity tools and analytics to track progress actually helps us do our work more efficiently and effectively. And it's helping us to be um, you know, leading in practices around sustainable business practices and operational savings. Now, as the largest gas distribution utility in the nation, SoCal Gas is leading to shape the clean energy future. And we are going to take a prominent role. More than shape the future, we will be accelerating the progress to a clean energy future in three significant ways. But before I get into that, I want to share a part of my journey to help frame up some of my thinking. Um, I, I think it's always helpful to understand someone's background and, and their journey to understand um, some of the thinking around this. My family immigrated here from South Korea when I was three years old. And I lived in a one bedroom apartment with my parents and my brother, um, you know, for a long time before we can even own a home. And my parents drove a, a white Regal Buick that they shared um, every day. Uh, for our, about a decade before we were even able to get a brand new car. And they worked 14 hours a day. And my brother and I, we were latchkey kids from the age of five. And I remember in first grade, we did a lot of cutting with scissors and gluing for hand-eye coordination. And I remember doing my homework and asking my dad to buy me glue, just white glue, nothing fancy. And you know what he gave me? He gave me a small spoonful of fully cooked rice. And then he showed me that if I squished the rice across the paper and spread it out, it was just as, if, just as effective as glue. So that's what I did. Every time I had an assignment on cutting and gluing, I went to the rice cooker, I got some rice. That's what I used as glue. Then in fourth grade, I needed a poster board. And I asked my dad to buy me one so I can work on my project. And you know what he did then? Well, about 30 minutes later, I had what looked like a poster board. It wasn't new and it wasn't like the ones my friends had, but it was cardboard and it was sturdy and it had the surface area that I needed. What I found later on, um, later on, what I found out was that he had cut that out of a discarded cardboard box. Because you see, Two days before, a new neighbor had moved in and my dad had welcomed them to the apartment complex by helping them move in and help them break down all the boxes and threw them away. I guess my dad was my first example of how to recycle and reuse and to repurpose what some may have thought of waste into something useful. Now, why do I share this story? Well, this highlights the very things that I wanted to really touch on the three things on what the things that we are doing to accelerate our impact. What are those three things? Well, first, we are going to leverage the multi billion dollar gas infrastructure, the generations of our families have paid to build over the past 150 years, including you and I. On top of our investment, gas infrastructure today is critical for flexibility, storage, reliability, and resiliency. And on the happens chance, and this is not reality and this will not happen, but on the happens chance that we do nothing today to advance towards decarbonizing our gas infrastructure, there is still so much value that goes unrecognized. The gas infrastructure will continue to be the resilient infrastructure required to achieve 100% renewable electricity and a fully decarbonized and diversified energy future. Decarbonization does not mean the elimination of the gas system. And I really want to stress that. The gas infrastructure will be required to support large scale adoption with renewable natural gas, hydrogen, and advanced distributed energy 
and carbon capture technologies that is so needed if we are going to reach our net zero goals. Next, second thing is we are seizing every opportunity to discover, demonstrate, and advance techno technological and clean fuels progress to promote a sustainable, clean energy future that is resilient and more affordable than not. Technologies are important, but as I noted earlier, how we implement and manage them will be even more critical. So I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that when we talk about innovation, it is not only at the heels of new technology. Innovation is anything that brings about a solution to the table. It's about continuous improvements. It's about building on what we do well today. And continuous improvement is based on science and data and experience. It can be as simple as repurposing the use of white rice because we couldn't afford white glue or repurposing what one considered trash into some, something that promoted education and learning. And it can be as complex as revisiting hydrogen 20 years after it was first introduced as a potential energy solution. And the third area we will continue to spend a tremendous amount of effort on our partnerships. Much like, we, much like we are collectively sharing best practices, methodologies, challenges, and successes today, we firmly believe the goal to a net zero future to protect our planet can only happen as a collective effort. It's important to remind ourselves what problem we are solving for. If the question at hand is about solving for climate change, a global issue, no single entity can solve this problem. No single solution can solve this problem. And no single energy source can do it alone effectively. It takes every single one of us. It takes partnerships with academia, industry trades, local businesses, community members and future leaders such as yourselves. And I applaud any organization or entity that is raising their hand to take on the challenge of scope three emissions because the fact is they don't have to. And what it really sparks, um, what it really speaks to for me is um, the choice that they are making to take the opportunity to collaborate and truly solve for the bigger problem, which is climate change. And no matter who you are or how big your organization is, a net zero climate commitment is huge. And for those who do not deal with this question every single day, a goal out to 2045 or mid-century seems very far away. Not only does it seem far away, but it almost allows one to mistakenly believe that we have a lot of time. We disagree. Here's the problem. Human influence on climate is clear. And recent greenhouse gas emissions are the highest in the history. We know that if we do not start addressing the problem adequately long before mid-century, we're going to have widespread and long lasting impacts on our natural ecosystems with very severe consequences, some that are irreparable. Now in 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, confirmed that in order to limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius, the world would need to cut its CO2 emissions by half by the year 2030. And to achieve such reductions, major, it's going to require major and immediate transformation. So we don't have the luxury of time. And it's also very clear that companies who take action to transition now will be in a better position than their competitors to attract investments, to mitigate climate related risks early to have learnings from it and to take advantage of the opportunities 
instead of looking solely at the challenges associated with it. SoCal Gas has been investing in early decarbonization efforts since 2006. And SoCal Gas is going to continue to invest in our three Ds that will one, promote technologies and programs that can be deployed immediately. Today, energy efficiency is the most cost-effective mature technology with widespread consumer acceptance. Those two things don't go hand in hand for most things that we have today. Widespread consumer acceptance is a big thing. It's a big hurdle. Renewable natural gas is a drop in fuel that requires zero equipment or infrastructure changes to our gas grid. So we can have RNG in our system flowing today with no issues, and we do. The California, the California strategy to meet its greenhouse gas reduction goals include short-lived climate pollutants, SLCPs. Yeah, all these acronyms, I get tongue-tied. Um, but it's a primate source of emission reductions, and that's about 35%. But of this 35%, of this portion, 62% of the short-lived climate pollutants are methane. And 80% of that comes from our waste streams. And we can repurpose that waste stream and we can make RNG, renewable natural gas. So what RNG does is that it brings with it the ability to remove methane from going into atmosphere and use it as a clean fuel. So promoting what is immediately available for us that accelerates the removal of climate pollutants is the first thing. The second thing is we will also advance approaches that have an outsized impact relative to others. This is why we are so focused on renewable gases. It's a fact that methane is 28 times more powerful of a greenhouse gas than CO2. What RNG does for us is it solves a big methane emissions problem. RNG is an opportunity to take the waste that we produce as a society and not only prevent those emissions from going to atmosphere, but it also presents the opportunity to use that waste as a fuel, as energy. The state's Air Resources Board inventory shows that over 70, close to 80% of the methane to atmosphere problem is from our own waste streams. That is landfills, all the trashy center landfills, waste and agriculture. California is one of the largest ag states in the country. Most people don't know that. The United Nations recently also published a report. And this morning, there was a Los Angeles Times op-ed that highlights the world's top five meat and dairy companies combine to be emitting more greenhouse gases per year than a large oil and gas company like ExxonMobil. It states that even if fossil fuels use ended overnight, we stop using fossil fuel altogether tonight, the global emissions related to food production alone are on track to make it impossible for us to meet our Paris Climate Agreement target of one and a half degrees Celsius. That's a huge statement. So right now, most RNG is being made from food waste and farm waste, agricultural waste and manure. So for me, when I look at that, it's exciting how much of a difference RNG has made to combat air pollution climate change, because a great deal of it right now is being used to fuel the clean trucks, the transportation sector today, to reduce pollution surrounding highways. The transportation corridors that carry all the goods that come through our ports up and down our state. But RNG can also be made from dead trees and forests. That dead wood needs to be managed to help prevent further wildfires that we're facing in the state of California. This is a growing problem, especially in California with increasing wildfire threats. 
And there's a huge opportunity here to capture those emissions from the forest materials and use it to create renewable fuel. Cutting methane is the strongest lever we have to slow climate change over the next 25 years and critical to getting to zero. Now RNG helps us to do, RNG helps us do that today in a huge way. It's not something we have to wait for. We can do that today. And this is why we have a goal to have 20% of our core deliveries of renewable natural gas by 2030. Now, the third thing is that we will invest in partnerships, as I stated before, in systems that enable reductions in the most GHG intensive sectors. It is clear that the overall global trend in energy is leaning towards a low carbon future. Equally clear is that people will use a lot more electricity. I mean, it's estimated already that it will double in California by 2045. And as the demand for electricity grows, it creates the need for more long-term energy storage to compensate for the intermittent renewable electricity production. And this long-term energy storage can be in the form of gas. Hydrogen can do that for us. It may be surprising to most, but when asked about electrification, I say hands down, we support electrification where it makes sense. And electrification is not possible in all sectors. That's a fact. And electrification is not possible without increased investments in the gas grid to provide the energy needed when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining. And as I mentioned earlier, electrif electrification alone cannot support the decarbonization of our largest GHG emitters, who also happens to be the largest economic engines in the state and a large part in the nation. And that's the industrial processing, the transportation sector, People often forget that Southern California, in addition to Hollywood and the beaches, it's home to the top industrial hubs in the nation. And we cannot electrify the industries that use extremely high heat for processing metals and products. We need solutions that will support our goals to reduce GHG emissions that meet these requirements like renewable natural gas and hydrogen these are the clean fuels and molecules that will allow for a full decarbonization in the sector without crippling the economy. We are also home in Southern California to the two largest ports in the entire nation, ports of LA and ports of Long Beach. And with that comes large emissions from the ships, the heavy duty trucks, the rails, to haul the goods from the ports to the distribution centers and beyond up here you know, to Stanford and the Bay Area across the nation. For the transportation sector that carries goods and materials, they're going to need solutions that allow them to carry more goods and go longer distances with less fuel. They're gonna need a zero emission fuel or technology that helps to support them. Now, battery electric options are good in some applications, but very limited and pose very huge operational concerns around weight, the weight of the batteries, around length of time to recharge, to make deliveries on time, especially for the long haul and heavy duty industries. However, another zero emission option is a fuel cell electric truck. It is also an electric option. It's a zero emission option, but it does use molecules. And fuel cell electric trucks are being demonstrated today with the use of hydrogen. As for large ships and rails, liquefied natural gas and hydrogen can be a solution in the future. Bottom line is that we need to implement solutions 
that allow the economic engines of our state to continue to operate cost-effectively and sustainability, sustainably. Now, progress is not a luxury, it, it, it's necessary. This slide shows some of the most critical and immediate goals we put forth as part of our proof points on near-term targets to get our scopes one and two emissions under control and to start demonstrating tangible progress towards our scope three emissions. We will add additional goals to these over the next several months. And we will be diving into what the right key performance metrics are, how to leverage the information that we have and what tools may be available to support us so that we can track and analyze metrics and data points, present the data in a meaningful way and provide insights into what more we can do and how we can accelerate our progress. Now our climate commitment and our broad sustainability plan is an integration of business activities that support operational excellence, continuous improvement with a focus on opportunities to effectively combat climate change. If you haven't noticed by now, my dad had a huge big, he had a huge influence in my life. And just to add one more dad story here, um, he used to always say, we cannot possibly know where we are going if we do not know where we have been and where we are standing today. What I shared with you today is a highlight of our first steps. It's just the beginning. The next phase between now and the end of this year is really to build out our full sustainability plan that examines the intersectionality, and this is where I get excited, the intersectionality of climate, waste, water, energy, and how that directly impacts our communities and the people and the affordability, the diversity and the inclusion, all of that, they come together and we need to work together to transparently communicate how that happens, what the impacts are, and how do we mitigate some of the biggest risks that we may pose or face as community members. It will speak to how our energy and climate goals have a direct impact on our social imperatives of energy equity and energy poverty. Now, over the next 30 years, the way in which we produce, deliver, meter, and consume energy will look considerably different from what it is today. The challenge is that the changing climate will require an energy system that is resilient to wildfire, extreme weather, drought, while also delivering reliable, affordable, and increasingly decarbonized energy to our customers. The opportunity again is to reach carbon neutrality targets more effectively while preserving choice and energy resiliency. Looking at the entire ecosystem of energy as a balance of clean electrons from the electric grid, clean molecules through the gas grid, and leveraging both the electric and gas infrastructure to strengthen our ability to navigate our bold new world. Additionally, there's an opportunity to lead in a significant way through partnerships and collaboration. It is the only way we're going to solve this global problem. We cannot do it in isolation. And the opportunity to make progress today with all that is available to us and the significant progress we can further make together with future technologies, fuels and solutions. So it is my sincere hope that you walk away from today's conversation with at least one new fact that you didn't know before and that it generates an authentic curiosity about the gas system and its critical role in California's carbon neutral future. And lastly, uh, what I'd like to do is quickly share a five minute video uh, on all of the things that I touched on today uh, before I turn it back over to John 
um, and break out into our smaller groups. Around new forms of renewable gases, solar, wind, fuel cells, and carbon capture. At SoCal Gas, our mission is to be the cleanest, safest, and most innovative energy company in America. And we are committed to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2045. The reality is, some of the technologies that will get us there haven't even been invented. But there are four innovative technologies that have us well on our way. Renewable gas, where waste streams are harnessed and reused to make power, becoming emissions negative. Power to gas, where excess renewable electricity is used to create renewable gas and hydrogen, which can be stored, transported, and utilized for decades. Hydrogen fuel cells, where people can reliably power their homes, businesses, and transportation with net zero emissions. And carbon capture utilization and sequestration, where carbon can be captured and utilized in new production processes for products of the future. After all, decarbonization isn't new for us. We've already reduced distribution emission rates to 0.25%. While continuing to serve our 22 million customers without sacrificing reliability, resiliency, or affordability. When California wanted to reduce pipeline emissions 20% by 2025, SoCal Gas met the goal by 2021. In 2010, renewable gas wasn't even in use. By 2022, we will reach 5% capacity throughout our infrastructure, and 20% by 2030. On the journey to net zero, our mission is more than words. It's our ethos that guides every aspect of our business. What does clean look like? Clean is decarbonizing the gas grid. Clean is turning waste into energy. Clean is utilizing excess renewable energy. What does SAFE look like? SAFE is the diversity of clean energy sources. SAFE is industry-leading protocols. SAFE is the diversity of thought and culture. What does innovation look like? Innovation is evolving into a tech-first infrastructure company. Innovation is expanding the potential of renewable energy. Innovation is leading the evolution of energy. Our commitment is to make the air we breathe and the neighborhoods we share cleaner, safer, and more innovative because our evolution is our legacy. Well, uh, thanks, Michelle. That was a, a great way to end a great talk, I think. Uh, I'd like to talk to your producer of that uh, video clip uh, <laughs> sometime soon. Um, we don't have a lot of time for general audience questions. Uh, and fortunately for me, uh, you did answer a lot of the early questions by the time you got to the end, particularly the shorter term goals, lots of interest in that. So since you've already agreed to share your slides, I'm sure a lot of um, uh, viewers will be interested in that. Um, uh, then, too, I won't really get into a lot of the uh, give and take about gas versus electricity. Uh, I would like to focus on uh, a couple of things, maybe in one general area. That was, there was a tremendous amount of interest, and you really closed with this in many ways, uh, on the clean fuel side. So what, what can you provide just a little bit more detail on how you think the uh, hydrogen is going to work out? How much can you put in your current pipelines? Is there, are there clever ways to coat them to put more in? Will you have some hydrogen dedicated pipelines and others mixed in uh, with, uh, with gas? What is the role of CCS? I'm gonna go through all, probably all your uh, uh, big four there uh, at the end, but what's what's the game plan there? I, I think you, uh, you started with a bit of magic, but then put a tremendous amount of thought and force uh, between a believable corporate strategy. In fact, one of the more interesting questions was, so you want to go big, can you go as big as you, we might need you to go to solve this uh, problem? So I lumped a few things together there, but uh, anything you would like to say in any of those areas on the margin here would be a great, uh, a great service to our audience. 
Those are great questions, a fully loaded question, John. Thank you for that. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll tackle it little by little um, and, and see how much time we have. Um, you know, on the topic of hydrogen, I absolutely um, do think that hydrogen will play uh, a critical role um, in the decarbonization of our gas grid. Um, hydrogen is one, albeit an important one, uh, one solution of, of many. RNG is another one. Um, we are hoping that more available lower and zero carbon fuels will come online. But with respect to how much we can blend and what we're doing today, what I'll share is that today, um, what we have done as a statewide investor-owned utility collective is we have gone before the Public Utilities Commission to request and file an application for hydrogen blending standards. So what we have done is ask the commission hey, we'd like to examine this, but we wanna make sure we're gonna do this in a safe and responsible way. So we need to study this. We need to study this on our systems. You know, along with partnerships locally, we've had partnerships globally. We know that there are utilities in Europe, in Australia, in Asia, that have been blending hydrogen into their system. And they have been testing it. And a lot of studies have found um, or are saying to us, you know, these are just general parameters of what we are finding, but really to study this specifically, you have to look at your system. You have to blend it into your system. You have to look at the uniqueness of your pipelines, the composition of your pipelines, the methallurgy of your pipelines. What type of other valves and fittings are you using that a European market may not necessarily be using? And how does that have an impact on that? Because that all speaks to safety in our culture here. So what we're doing is we have asked the commission, let us do the due diligence. And we have asked for a hydrogen blending demonstration program. And with that, we are building out a case for doing case studies around a, a, a very a, a residential neighborhood in a very closed and contained area that we can study and examine. We are looking at potentially an industrial cluster and looking at examining that specifically. Um, and we also have um, what we launched um, earlier this year, the H2 Hydrogen Home at our Energy Resource Center in Downey, California. We are going to be building out a hydrogen home that really shows the entire value chain of, of the value of hydrogen from the time that it is produced by solar panels at a utility scale for it to be transported and sent to an electrolyzer to produce hydrogen stored by the home to be used either as electricity in the home or stored for later use in fuel cells as backup power for potential brownouts or blackouts and demonstrating that. So there's a couple of different things we're doing, but I think most importantly, what I'd like to point out is that we wanna do this safely. We wanna be responsible about it. So we are studying it and we're gonna to continue to study it, um, not just in isolation, but with partners nationally, but with other um, investor owned utilities throughout the state, including PG&E. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll have results over the next 12 to 24 months in terms of what we are finding, what those safe levels of blends look like. Um, and it may invariably come down to several different things, whether we can blend an X percent throughout the entire system or whether it's going to be um, isolated in very specific areas or systems based on the metallurgy of different pipes. Um, so all of that is being looked at and examined, as well as the impact that it will have on the end use appliances in homes and to our industrial customers. So we're looking at flame characteristics of how hydrogen or a blend of hydrogen impacts that. So we're looking at it from a lot of different aspects, from our systems aspect, but as well as how it will impact the customer. Um, so we're studying that, we're going to continue to study that, and we are doing that in a very public way through the Public Utilities Commission, so more information on that can be provided if needed um, or desired. With respect to CCUS, we look at carbon capture utilization and sequestration as definitely a tool of the future, um, and this is something that we have been examining in our RD&D group. Uh, for quite some time and we are continually examining 
the potential of carbon capture, not only from atmosphere, but in terms of material content, like cement and other things. Um, but really the purpose of once you capture that carbon, if it's not in a solid form, what do you do with that? Are you going to use it maybe at a beverage company? Are you going to sequester it? Are there areas available to us ge geographically in California that allows us to do that? Those are the very questions we're examining today with help and support from a lot of partners uh, to see if that becomes something feasible for us. Great, super. I see we're just about out of time for this part of the program. I think we're all envious of the students who get to uh, meet with you up close and personal to ask follow on questions. So with that, thank you, Michelle, for sharing your uh, enthusiasm and your innovative spirit uh, in this important uh, strategy, corporate strategy that you've developed. Thank you very much. We hope you come visit us uh, after we get through the pandemic, which now looks like it could be as early as next year. <laughs> would be happy to. thank you so much for having me thank you yeah go cow go stanford thank you to you as well thank you